Commissioner. I understand we got a full load today. We do. A couple of long ones, too. Well, pretty good. I won't need the teleprompter. I learned all these by heart. <laughs> Maybe you better just run it in case. <laughs> now, after my debut the other night, though, I may sing these. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. It was the first time in my life I have ever stood on a, a stage and sung. Really? Uh, singing for me has been in the shower. The sombrero? Huh? The sombrero? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> okay, all set? Give us a level check. Oh. Well, thank you, Bill, and my greetings to all of you at the 61st Annual NAB Convention. Thank you, Bill, and my greetings to all of you at the 61st Annual NAB Convention. I'm delighted to take part, although I wish I could be there with you in person. Let me say at the outset that I know all of you will miss the guiding hand of Vince Wasilewski now that he's retired. In his 17 years as your president, Vince has accomplished a great deal, not only for you, but for the millions of Americans served by the broadcast industry. I feel a special bond with him because of his Uncle John. He attended Eureka College, as I did, and John was just about the best darn basketball player and all-round athlete I remember from those days. Congratulations, Vince, on your Distinguished Service Award. You've earned it. And my best wishes to Eddie Fritz as he takes over the NAB presidency. Talking with you brings back a lot of memories of the days I spent as an announcer at WHO Radio in Des Moines. It was during the Depression, and I only made $75 a week, but I remember feeling I was on top of the world. At that time, the plums in local station work were opportunities to feed a program to the network. Well, my first plum was covering a swimming meet that didn't happen. The National AAU Championships were held in Des Moines. Perched high on a diving tower, I was to broadcast a 30-minute slot during the top four or five events of the meet. Just as we went on the air, coast to coast, an AAU official, Avery Brundage, a gentleman who was famous for his participation in a number of athletic debates, chose this moment to start another one. For 30 minutes to a network audience, I described the costumes of the arguing officials, identified the swimmers who were practicing dives and turns, and at the end of 30 minutes, returned the airwaves to the network without having described a single event. Five minutes later, the first event took place, and to my enormous frustration, the winner of that event established a new national swimming record. Yeah, those were the days. I was heartened and proud recently to learn of your efforts in today's broadcasting industry to encourage American productivity. Through your national Let's Work Together campaign, you're using your microphones, cameras, and transmitters to inspire our people to greater achievement and a heightened sense of national unity. You have correctly isolated one of our greatest challenges. By increasing awareness, your Broadcasting Industry Council to improve American productivity will be an enormous boost in our drive to ensure solid and lasting economic recovery. As broadcast journalists have been reporting, America has begun to take the first crucial steps into recovery. Times are still difficult for too many of our people, but lately almost every economic barometer has been signaling a bright and hopeful outlook. 
we're on the move again. This year, new and existing home sales have been up, housing starts and permits have been up, and overall construction spending has been on the increase. Our overall productivity is improving, and with your encouragement, I'm confident we can send it soaring. The stock market is strong, real wages are rising, and our leading economic indicators in February made their biggest jump in 33 years. On top of all that, inflation has risen at an annual rate of just four-tenths of one percent for the last six months, the lowest six-month average in 22 years. And in February, the consumer price index actually dropped. Interest rates are now half what they were when I took office, and we'll get them lower. In the face of all this good news, our administration has issued more optimistic growth estimates for our economy. We are now predicting a growth rate for the four quarters of 1983 to be 4.7%, a dramatic improvement over last year's sluggish nine-tenths of 1%. There's no doubt about it. The American economy is picking up steam. If we can boost the American spirit too, as you're doing with your calls to work together for greater productivity, and if the Congress works with us to do what is necessary, we can embark on a new period of economic greatness unrivaled in all our history. So, on behalf of all Americans, thanks again for the private sector initiatives of your Productivity Council and for the high standards of integrity and journalistic ethics you promote. For our part, we in this administration remain committed to relieving unnecessary regulation of your industry and to standing firmly behind the guarantees of freedom of speech and press in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Good luck to all of you as you bring this convention to a close. I wish I could sit in on your government, labor, and business productivity session, but I know Ray Donovan will bring back good reports. I look forward to working with you in the months ahead as together we pick up speed along America's recovery trail. Thank you, and God bless you. signing a picture like this, I'd simply say, Ron, but I didn't dare do some of them that and some I of them not. Out, it's just a whole stack of them. Lumber Association, take one. Action. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to participate in the third annual Daphne Awards program. I can think of no more appropriate place for the National Hardwood Lumber Association to recognize excellence than High Point, North Carolina, a place some call the capital of the furniture industry. Almost 65% of the furniture made in the United States is manufactured within 100 miles of High Point. My friend and your senator, Jesse Helms, has told me about your awards program for furniture design, quality, and value. Striving to make our work the best it can be and competing to bring value to consumers are twin pillars of America's free enterprise system. I know Jack Veach and all of you are dedicated to these principles. If we can reawaken your kind of spirit throughout our private sector, we will be well on our way to making America great again. As you and the lumber industry have already begun to see, America has taken the first crucial steps into economic recovery. I know times are still very difficult. Many millions of our people are still without jobs. But lately, almost every economic barometer 
has been signaling a bright and hopeful outlook. We're on the move again. This year, new and existing home sales have been up, housing starts and permits have been up, and overall construction spending has been on the increase. Our overall productivity is improving. The stock market is strong. Real wages are rising. And our leading economic indicators in February made their biggest jump in 33 years. On top of all that, inflation has risen at an annual rate of just four-tenths of one percent for the last six months, the lowest six-month average in 22 years. And in February, the consumer price index actually dropped. Interest rates are now half what they were when I took office, and we'll get them lower. In the face of all this good news, our administration has issued a more optimistic estimate for growth in this year's gross national product. We're now projecting a growth rate for four quarters of 83 to be 4.7 percent, a dramatic improvement over last year's sluggish nine-tenths of one percent. The growth we so badly need to put our people back to work and restore prosperity has begun, and it's picking up steam every day. Together, we've got America on the mend. I would like to thank each of you for the care, effort, and pride you take in your work. The American home is at the heart of our society, and your industry does so much to improve the quality of life there. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person to celebrate the accomplishments represented by the Daphne Awards, but I would like to congratulate the winners and each of you for encouraging them. My best wishes to all of you for a successful year ahead as together we keep America on the recovery trail. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Uh, I know I... I think we have to try that again. Are you sure? Latha. Latha, Everett's of Latha Schroeder. Schroeder? Yes. Latha Schroeder. Yeah. The T comes out. So, was it clear that he was saying eighty-three as in the year? Eighty-three. We're to see in the next installment. I thought it was very well done, and uh, I wonder sometimes about all those several-hour things, though, if they don't get some of that by being a little slow. I mean, I thought there were times when you. Uh, you know, you, um, you'd seen those sheep go across that bridge <laughs> a lot of times. It was, it was a little draggy. Huh? It was 500 sheep that they rented at $50 a day for that. $50 a day? Yeah. For all 500 or a piece? No, a piece. Per head. Per head. Really? Jeez. <laughs> Holy toad. You know where they shot it? Where? In Simi Valley. I just assumed they were in Australia. The whole thing was done in Simi Valley. In Simi Valley. Yeah. They said it looked just like that area of Australia that it's supposed to be. For heaven's sakes. And of course, in the California's dry season, it would all be brown that, that way and everything. Scorched look that, you know, Wait till I tell like Nancy that. I just assumed that that was one of the reasons for the slowing, that they were giving us all that scenery and everything. No, well, I'll be done. Well, they had it figured out at $2 million to transport crew and equipment down there. That one? They had it costed out at $2 million to transport Equipment to Australia, if they had shot it there. Well, they found the location in California, they stayed there. Well, for heaven's sakes. Remember that is it's between the two. <coughs> that little girl last night mm, was so cute. Mm -hmm. mm. She didn't grow up as cute as she was. <laughs> I missed her being an adult. Oh. Yeah. Stand by. Neighbor helping neighbor is truly an American tradition. And from April 17th to the 23rd, we're recognizing that tradition through National Volunteer Week. In communities across the country, volunteers are being saluted for their selfless giving of talent, time, and love. These individuals come from all ages, races, and areas of our country. They comprise a volunteer corps of more than 84 million strong, contributing an estimated $64 billion of their time and talent each year. Their efforts are as close as the local neighborhood crime watch, the little league field down the block, or the canvasser at your front door seeking a charitable contribution. 
They may be elderly citizens helping in a local tutoring program, or they may be youngsters brightening the lives of nursing home residents. A volunteer can be a religious leader who establishes a local food bank or a businessman who contributes his management skills to the local schools. Regardless of their walk of life, the skills they provide or the activity for which they volunteer, these citizens are genuinely public spirited. They are the best of our citizens. And did you ever stop to think what it would be like if America's volunteers went on strike or quit? Well, I know there'd be a lot of sad little boys in St. Louis if not for the continuous efforts of Martin Matthews and Hubert Dickey. Oh, I'm sorry. Hubert Dickey Ballantyne. Oh, nuts. Yeah. Mm. Volunteer week take two. Neighbor helping neighbor is truly an American tradition. And from April 17th to the 23rd, we're recognizing that tradition through National Volunteer Week. In communities across the country, volunteers are being saluted for their selfless giving of talent, time, and love. These individuals come from all ages, races, and areas of our country. They comprise a volunteer corps of more than 84 million strong contributing an estimated $64 billion of their time and talent each year. Their efforts are as close as the local neighborhood crime watch, the little league field down the block, or the canvasser at your front door seeking a charitable contribution. They may be elderly citizens helping in a local tutoring program, or they may be youngsters brightening the lives of nursing home residents. A volunteer can be a religious leader who establishes a local food bank or a businessman who contributes his management skills to the local schools. Regardless of their walk of life, the skills they provide or the activity for which they volunteer, these citizens are genuinely public spirited. They are the best of our citizens. And did you ever stop to think what it would be like if America's volunteers went on strike or quit? Well, I know there'd be a lot of sad little boys in St. Louis. If not for the continuous efforts of Martin Matthews and Hubert Dickey Valentine, recreational programs for that city's youth would wither away. In Houston, many of the unemployed would go without medical care. Dr. Joel Reed, president of the area's medical society, and over 1,200 doctors and 300 pharmacists have treated thousands of patients within the last month. If volunteerism stopped, so would their vital service. And handicapped children in Portland, Oregon, would not be able to enjoy the zoo if the creative volunteer efforts of Latha Schroeder and the Zenith Women's Club were stopped. If volunteerism ceased, so would the spaghetti suppers and pancake breakfasts, the aerobic jazz marathons, skate-a-thons, raffles, and door-to-door -door calls that Thomas Sullivan and the Variety Club of Buffalo use to raise funds for the local children's hospital. And the elderly in Waterloo, Iowa, would go without the nourishing homegrown food that's supplied them by Roger Bleeker and the members of the United Auto Workers Local 838 through their Brown Baggers program. Of course, none of these scenarios will likely take place because these citizens, just like millions of other volunteers, are dedicated to helping others. Our country wouldn't be the decent place it is without their efforts. I'd like to take this opportunity to salute the Roger Bleakers, the Dr. Reeds, and the Latha Schroders of this country. The poet William Wordsworth once said that the best portion of a good man's life is his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and love. I'm sure I speak for all Americans when I say that these acts, especially during National Volunteer Week, should not go unnoticed. America is truly grateful for the continuing bounty of volunteer generosity. And recognizing the significance of volunteer efforts, I have established an office of private sector initiatives in the White House to recognize and encourage direct citizen action. I also want to urge those of you who haven't been involved to do so. It's an age-old truth found in most of the world's religions that in giving we receive and in healing we are healed. Ask any volunteer why he or she is involved and you'll find that volunteering isn't just a means of getting things done, but is itself a valuable, fulfilling experience. We have much to be thankful for in America, but perhaps our most precious assets 
our most valuable resources are our volunteers. This is their week, and let's let them know just how much they mean to us. Thank you, and God bless you. Good. When I was governor of California, I had the privilege of knowing Tom McCall as the dynamic and effective governor of a neighboring state. We met on many occasions, and with each meeting, my respect for him, his energy, his creativity, and his integrity grew. Tom McCall was the kind of individual and the kind of public servant of whom any state could be proud. His memory serves to inspire us all. Maybe I should wait.